Um, thanks very much, Will. Uh, and thanks to the Brandwatch team, uh, Chelsea and Heaven, everyone, for making this. I organize my own events. And I know how hard this is. And this has been a really, really, for a speaker, a really beautiful experience. So thanks a huge amount to them. Um, first of all, I want to say three things about myself. Number one, I'm a Brit. And I apologize for being the third Brit in a row on stage today. Um, I assure you, it gets a lot more diverse after this. Um, secondly, I love America. And I love baseball. I had the huge, love, lovely opportunity to go see the Rockies last night and then get caught in an absolute killer thunderstorm on the way home, <laughs> which was just really brilliant and really, really lovely. So it's great. It's my first time in Denver, really loving it here, and it's been a fantastic experience. And the third thing I want you to know about me is I'm a massive nerd, an absolutely grade A nerd who's been working digital in very many different ways for about the last 25 or so years. Um, but as Will said, what I want to do today in the next half hour or so is to try and give you a framing based on my experience working in digital in sometimes very, very traditional media organizations um, and give you a way of framing the change that we're going through at the moment that Will was talking about that hopefully might help you create a bit more perspective and a bit more of a kind of airline view of the changes we're going through now. So I'm going to do six things. Um, I'm going to talk about who I am a bit briefly. I'm going to introduce a way of thinking about the schedule, which we all probably feel like we understand. I'm going to try and make you see the schedule in a very different way. I'm then going to talk about the stream. I'm going to talk about how the stream is changing the way we tell stories today. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges. Now, as I said, I am an absolute massive nerd, and I love working in digital, and I love working in this space. But we are at the point in the development of this stuff where it's affecting the real world. And whenever new technologies get to that level of mainstream development, we see problems. We see things that we need as the leaders and as the pioneers in this field. We need to take those on board and understand them. And then finally, I'm going to do the kind of thing that you should never, ever do at a talk like this, particularly if it's going to be videoed and put on the web. I'm going to try and make some predictions about what might happen next. So first of all, hello. Um, I'm Matt Locke from Story Things. I started Story Things about uh, six years ago. Um, after working in broadcast in a digital environment, I was head of innovation for the BBC for about seven years. Uh, then I was a commissioning editor and head of multi-platform at Channel 4. And I started Story Things because I was really, really fascinated by how the way we tell stories is changing and the way that audiences are changing. And that's what we do at Story Things. Um, the time I spent working in two broadcasters, it was really weird to go and work for the BBC in 2001 because I'd never worked in TV or radio. I'd worked in the arts, I'd worked in digital for about 10 years or so. And to walk into an organization that, as a Brit, when you work for the BBC, it kind of feels like you're joining the mothership. It feels like you're becoming part of this incredible part of, of British culture. But I found it deeply weird. And the 11 years I spent working in broadcasting I just found really, really strange. And it took me a while to work out why I thought it was strange. And eventually, I realized I was working with a group of people who, from my perspective, really had a very, very, very shallow understanding of the audience. Um, this was around 2001. So for about the last 40 or 50 years, a couple of generations of TV executives had worked through the industry using Nielsen ratings or Barb ratings as a way of understanding their audience, as their primary uh, way of engaging with the audience. Um, and that's a really, really, it's a very scientific metric. It's very interesting. But it doesn't really give you that visceral understanding of the audience that we all take for granted in digital. In actual fact, I remember watching a documentary once about the making of Blackadder, which is a, a, a very kind of famous BBC comedy with Rowan Atkinson. And the director was um, a filmmaker who, the guy who made Love Actually, Richard Curtis. And they were interviewing him about the show. And he said that when the first season went out, they didn't get it quite right. And then they brought a new writer on, and it got better in the second series. But he stopped and said this amazing anecdote, that when he was making shows for the BBC in the 80s, he didn't get any data at all. People measured ratings, but there were only three channels. So the amount of actual change in the audience any one night was not really that significant. And so if you were a creative working in TV, you weren't given that data. You weren't told about the audience. And he said something which I found fascinating. He said when he made the first series of Blackadder, he really wanted to see what people felt so badly, but he felt so cut off that he used to walk through the streets of Shepherd's Bush as it was being broadcast, looking in people's windows to see if they were watching, and if they were, were they laughing? That was, that was how cut off he was from the feedback loop of the audience. So this golden age of telly that we think of in the 80s, 90s, etc., was a golden age of creativity, but it was also a very silent age. It was an age in which our relationship as storytellers with the audience was, was virtually non-existent. 
And so as a result of this kind of curiosity, I've spent the last decade or so trying to understand this more. What is the history of how we have understood audiences? What's the history of this feedback loop we have between creative storytellers and audiences? And how does that change as technologies develop? And in particular, I've been looking over a very long time scale. I realized when I started working in broadcasting that because the last 40 or 50 years had been so um, stable in many ways, so familiar in the way that the TV industry worked, that I had to go back further. I had to look back before TV and before broadcasting to try and understand how things are developed the way they are. So out of this research, I'm going to try and give you two ways of thinking about the way that technologies and audiences change culture and shape culture. One of which is about 100 years old, the schedule. One of which is as old as Brandwatch itself. It's only about a decade old. First of all, I want to talk about the schedule. Now, many of us will feel like we know what a schedule is. But have you ever stopped to think why it exists in the way it was? Who actually decided that we would organize content according to hour-long or half-hour-long chunks, and that they would synchronize with the clock, and it would kind of play out all day? It's weird to think of that as something that was actually a problem that somebody needed to solve at one point in history. And we're going through a very similar transition now to when that problem was, uh, uh, was were first kind of solved in the early years of broadcasting. When this happens, when a new technology comes along that changes the relationship between content and audiences, we see the emergence of new concepts for organizing attention that addresses the way that audiences are starting to behave. And in the late 19th century, before even radio and, bro uh, and broadcasting started, one of these concepts was invented, and that concept was the schedule. And it wasn't invented by radio. It was actually invented for a telephone service that pre-existed the radio. So as the telephone, which you know, was a phenomenally disruptive technology, uh, grew out across Europe and America in the late 19th century, some entrepreneurs thought that this wasn't just going to be a way for people to communicate. It was going to be a way of sending content to people. Um, and some entrepreneurs started what were called telephone newspapers. These were services that you could subscribe to, and you would have a telephone uh, put in your house. And at any time of day, you could pick up the phone, and you could hear content being broadcast down the pipes into your living room. Now, this is the first time that that kind of technological broadcast system had been set up. And they were pretty popular. This one, the Telephone Hamondo, that was very big in Budapest, had around 36,000 subscribers who paid a monthly subscription to get this content. But the organizers, the entrepreneurs who invented these, had a problem. How do you know how long a story should be when there's no physical um, or kind of human limit? Up until now, content was either as long as a newspaper or magazine could be produced economically, or if it was theater or opera, it was as long as a human could comfortably sit in a room uh, without getting too upset. But suddenly, they had this option of no boundaries whatsoever of how long something could be. So how should they organize storytelling? And they decided to organize it according to time. And the schedule was really invented by the Telephone Hamondo. And this is uh, an example from 1907, towards the end of its, its period, just before radio took over. And they decided to organize content by locking it to the hourly clock of the day. So programs were around half an hour, quarter hour. They were all part hours. Um, they were repeats during the day here, 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock a repeat of the half day's most interesting news. A lot of the schedule that we recognize from radio and, tele and television was actually invented in 1907 by the Telephone Hamondo. And of course, as radio and then TV took over, they adopted the schedule as their format for organizing audiences' attention. And my theory is that actually that invention, the schedule, has had more impact on culture in the last 100 years than any of these individual technologies of radio and television. Because without the, the schedule, those technologies could have ended up very, very different indeed. Imagine, for example, if the tele television had actually ended up being like a record player. And rather than having synchronized scheduled content beamed it into the television, you hired tapes or records or something and played content locally in, the, in your own time. Culture would have been wildly different. So I'm, my kind of bet is that actually the schedule is probably the most important concept of the 20th century. The schedule has four distinct qualities that has made it have such an impact. The first one is that it's synchronized. That it's synchronized to the clock, but also it's synchronized for all of the audience. Everybody sees the same thing at exactly the same time. And the second is it's homogenous. It's the same experience for all users at pretty much the same time, particularly in that kind of golden era of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, when channels were, were very, very limited. The third one is that it's regulated. 
uh, politicians quickly realized that these ability to send uh, messages into people's homes was so potentially politically challenging that they needed to control who had access to the power of radio and TV networks. So it was regulated by governments. And finally, it was scheduled. Somebody had to make the decision of what shows were going to be broadcast when. Now, the one thing I really learned when I worked at Channel 4 in particular is that the real power base um, in a broadcaster, and anyone that's worked in a broadcaster will kind of recognize this, is not necessarily the talent. It's not necessarily the commissioning editors. It's not even really the chief executives. It's the schedulers. The person who decides what hour your show is going to, there's a couple of nods in the audience here from people who probably worked in TV. Somebody can make or break your show based on where they put it in the schedule. Depending on what competition you're up against on other channels, what shows are going on before you or after you. There's huge dark arts in scheduling, which have become incredibly complex over time. So controlling the schedule was probably the most powerful position in the broadcasters, particularly in the late 20th century. And the schedule over the 20th century went on to really dominate both the economics and the cultural impact of media and technology. This is a great chart from Bloomberg um, about how advertising spend has changed in the US over the last nearly 100 years. So down here, this black shape, by the way, is not just the background. That's actually newspaper. Um, so that's all of the newspaper advertising at the time. And the schedule starts to kick in in around 1926 with radio. And you can see over time, schedule starts to take more and more of the advertising dollars, and then TV comes in. And by the end of the 20th, beginning of the 21st century, about 40 to 50% of ad content is going to scheduled broadcast media rather than to newspapers, magazines, or um, other forms. I'm going to come back to that later because I think understanding and looking at the 20th century as a period in which the schedule gradually dominated the economics and culture of our society is something I want us to think about when we think about the stream. So what kind of culture, society, and what kind of brands developed because of the schedule? Many of you are here because you work for brands that really grew up in this era of the schedule. The major FMCG brands all kind of were brought into our living room through advertising tied to the schedule, whether that was on radio or whether it was on TV. It developed a culture in which surface image became more and more important. Um, so politicians like Nixon um, met their downfall because they were not good on TV. Um, and new kinds of celebrities emerged from people that were being beamed into our living rooms every single day at exactly the same time. It had this massive impact on our culture. And I think when McLuhan talks about the medium as a message, he's talking about the technologies of TV. He's talking about the fact that it's visual and colorful and noisy. But I think he's also talking about the power of the schedule. Um, when he says the medium is a message, what he means is the mechanisms, the, the kind of transmission technologies of, of television were as culturally important as the content that appeared on it. And I would add the schedule as a concept to his kind of taxonomy of um, effects from media in the 20th century. But in the last decade, a new concept has emerged which I think is going to be as important to the 21st century as the schedule was to the 20th, and that's the stream. Just over a decade ago, two things happened. Uh, Twitter launched and Facebook introduced its newsfeed, which many of us who were on Facebook at the time might remember was a terrible, terrible idea. The response to the introduction of the newsfeed was apocalyptic. Everybody hated it. And then very, very quickly, we loved it. We really, really loved it indeed. Before the stream, uh, before the newsfeed, if you wanted to see what your friends were doing on Facebook, you had to go and visit their walls, just like you would visit My MySpace or Bebo pages or things like that. But the newsfeed took all of these updates from all of these different pages and organized them into one never-ending stream. And that sounds like a simple product development, but it actually has really, really important cultural impacts. Just as the schedule had its four defining qualities, the stream has four defining qualities as well. The first one is it's personalized. There is literally nobody in this room who has exactly the same experience of Facebook, Twitter, or another kind of app like that to somebody else sitting in the room. Even if we have large Venn diagrams of overlap in our tastes and interests and follows, the stream is exactly personalized for you. And the second is that it's mobile. 
And by mobile, I don't just mean that it works well on mobile phones, although actually the invention of the smartphone and, and, and the iPhone in particular uh, just after the stream was really responsible for it becoming so popular and, and, and for a success with audiences. That ability to just kind of use your thumb to, to scroll through a stream of content. The two were, you know, the, the form factor of our hands, mobile phones, these magic pieces of glass, and the stream as a, as a form factor for organizing attention are just perfect. That kind of click, click, click is, is incredible. The third thing, and this is a slightly more complex one to understand, is that the stream is decontextualized. And I'll come back to this a bit later on. But what I mean is the stream takes content from other places and organizes it in a new context for you. Um, now, that's a brilliant surface in lots and lots of ways, but it has really major impacts. It makes it very, very hard for people publishing and producing content to control the context of audience reception. You know, we are not in charge of the stream as producers. We can play nicely with it. We can try and understand how to optimize it. But ultimately, we do not have control. And scale on the stream happens not because you've got access to power as scale happened in the world of the schedule. If you wanted a show to be big in the 80s or 90s, you would have to go and pitch commissioners and, and kind of get to know broadcasters and get them to commission your show and put it on. You needed the power that they had to dis distribute your content. In the stream, we get scale through lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of decontextualization, of people taking our messages, putting them into their streams, and sending them out again. That constant process of kind of sharing and retweeting and liking and faving, and all those little signals that the algorithm picks up is how we get scale. So we don't lose control when things get big in a world of the stream. We only get big when we lose control. And that's a fascinating impact for all of us who are involved in storytelling, whether you're a brand, whether you're creative, or whatever. And the fourth thing about the stream is that it's endless. And I mean endless in two ways. The first is, is that the stream itself never ends. There's always something else every time you refresh. There isn't a full stop. You don't get a message from Facebook saying, you're done for the day. Go home and look after the kids. It's endless. Never, never stops. But secondly, it's endless in that it can always return. Somebody can find your tweet from three years ago, as Donald Trump is finding out increasingly nowadays, and represent it, reintroduce it into the stream, and get currency and get scale again. So those things you said years ago can always come back. You never finish a story. So understanding how to do endings in the world of a stream, how do you create that cathartic moment of completion, is a really, really interesting problem. And we're not even beginning to understand how to do that yet. So each of those four qualities has fundamentally changed in the last 10 years, the production, discovery, and monetization of stories. We used to distribute programs on schedules uh, driven by broadcasters uh, who sold uh, advertising content to brands. Now, our stories are discovered through social algorithms. They're consumed on mobile devices. They're recontextualized by the sharing and reactions, and they're monetized by GAFA, the big platform owners of Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. In other words, we've had to learn how to tell stories that will be circulated in streams, that will be shared and passed around, not just distributed in schedules. And this feels obvious. I don't, it feels like I'm teaching your stuff you know already. But I think from a broader cultural perspective, it's really important to understand the difference that that makes. Um, I love BuzzFeed for lots of reasons. I do think they do this brilliant combination of journalism. But I think as a business, they were one of the first publishers who were built for this world of the stream. They were built to take advantage of um, this sharing and this activity. Uh, Jonah Peretti's background, for those of you who, who, who don't know, was actually in the arts. He used to run uh, a center called iBeam in New York. And one of the things he did in the early 2000s was he used to run a viral content competition with a bunch of friends. And it all started because he did something in a pre-social media era. Um, Nike had introduced an uh, online tool called Nike ID, where you could get a word printed onto the back of your trainer and do that online, and they would send you the trainer. And Joshua asked if he could have one with the word sweatshop on the back of the shoe. And they rejected it. And he got into an email conversation with Nike about this. And uh, they basically said, no, no, no. And he was like, it's not against your rules. It's not a swear word. It's not a trademark. It's not any of those things. Why won't you let me have sweatshop on the back of your trainer? And in, in the end, it kind of finished. And he sent the email chain to a bunch of his friends. And they sent it to some of their friends. And they sent it to some of their friends. And within a week, he was on the Today program talking about this big kind of viral content story. And so Josh thought, how did this happen? How did my story go from something that basically 
um, was just being discussed by my friends, there's something that got me on the Today program. And he went to spoke, speak to a few of his friends at MIT, um, one of whom was looking at network theory, but one that was also looking at psychological theories of why we share content. And those two insights helped him to develop first the Huffington Post and then later BuzzFeed. So his kind of interest and in, in, in business models have wholly been based around these qualities of the stream. But after a decade of the stream, we're starting to discover some of its problems. Number one, we're telling stories that people are sharing and algorithms are looking at that sharing and using that activity from users to decide the prominence of our stories. Now this is a fascinating and complex area that actually all of you guys understand almost definitely way more than I do. But one of the consequences is that when we learn the tricks and those tricks gets passed around, it means that a lot of stories in the stream can end up looking the same because we all know how to optimize our stories for this month's, this, this year's algorithms. So here's four videos from four different uh, providers on Facebook, uh, Al Jazeera, Upworthy, Now This, and Channel 4, my old uh, bosses are, uh, are in the UK. And anyone that's doing video online knows that there are certain rules you have to obey to. It has to be able to be played mute, it has to have lots of text, probably have to have something in the first five seconds to grab people's attention. But for me, this is leading to a kind of aesthetic flattening of how we tell stories. It's really difficult to tell stories that don't obey to those rules because we know that those are the rules that audiences and the algorithm reward. Secondly, the stream is probably the most incredible tool that's ever been built for getting stories to audiences, but it's an incredibly hard place to actually make money, unless you're Facebook, Amazon, Google, or Apple, that is. Um, so the Guardian recently in the UK has announced that they're pulling out of Facebook instant articles because they're just not getting the return from the ad revenue that makes sense to them as a business. Um, incidentally, they're also getting about 60% of their mobile traffic from Google AMP. So it's a real give and take for them with the stream. But a lot of newspapers in particular have spent the last five or six years trying to find out how to build audiences in Facebook and are now starting to realize that it's really hard for them to turn those audiences into uh, monetized subscribers and, and revenue things. This is a phenomenal chart from the Reuters Institute Journalism, Media, and Technology Trends Report. 99% of all growth in the advertising market in the US um, in the last, uh, between 2015 and 2016 went to either Google or Facebook. Um, phenomenal statistic, making it really, really hard for everyone else to make money out of the stream. The third thing that the stream has led to, and I know this is a subject that's gonna come, on a lot, come up a lot over the next two days, is fake news. Um, this is again from the Reuters Institute report and shows how Facebook engagements around the top 20 election stories changed in the run-up to the election and stories which have been identified as fake news tipped over just before election day. Now there's lots of challenges with this. How do we know what fake news is? How do we understand the context around news in order to understand whether something is true or not? This is the early years of a completely new idea of how we tell stories which is going to roll out over the next couple of decades. And we are facing one of those very, very early problems, is how do we define truth? How do we actually help audiences gauge the truthiness of these stories that they're seeing online? Fake news has really grown in the stream for two really important problems. The first is that idea of decontextualization that I said earlier. The stream is a product which tries to make everything really easy for you. And it does that by stripping stories from their original spaces and pulling them into this personalized stream. But that decontextualization takes away a lot of the cues that we as readers might have used to decide whether we trust this content or not. Um, it's really easy to take a screenshot and draw on it in red ink on MS Paint and then republish it to your Facebook feed. And that makes it really hard for people to understand context. In media literacy, in the broadcast era, there was this idea of reading behind, that an informed citizen would understand that news providers had agendas, they had investors, they had spin to what they were doing. So if you were reading behind, you could read a newspaper or watch a TV show, but you would also understand the political um, and kind of cultural inferences that that publisher might have. Reading behind is very, very hard on Facebook. The product is optimized to make that experience as simple and seamless as possible. And that makes reading behind really, really hard. And the second reason why the fake news grows on the stream is that it's a performative space. As I said earlier, scale happens on the screen, stream because we all re-perform um, stories all the time. We share them. It's an oral space as much as it is a literacy space. In actual fact, one of um, Marshall McLuhan's uh, assistants is a guy called Walter J. Ong, who wrote a brilliant book called Orality and Literacy, which is about the way in which culture grows 
in oral societies as opposed to literate societies, so societies in which stories spread through re-performance and retransmission compared to societies where things are written down and shared in perfect forms. And it's a really good book to read right now because I think the stream is more like the oral spaces of pre-Gutenberg culture than it is the literate spaces of the 20th century. And we tend to share stuff that says things that we care about to our friends. We, we share stuff that says, I am uh, a, a good kind of person. I care about this. I have opinions. I, you know, I want to do things. And those emotional signals mean that certain types of content uh, do far better in the stream than they would have in the schedule. So what happens next? To finish, I want to kind of think, where is this going to go? If we are 10 years into the beginning of the century of the stream, where might we go in the next few decades? I think in the very short term, we're going to see some publishers starting to move out of the stream. They've invested massively in the stream in the last five or six years, and their business models just aren't going to be sustainable. Um, so this is, again, from the Reuters Institute report, interviewing 130 journalists and editors who are running big online publications in the US and um, Europe. Um, and lots of people are starting to feel that actually they're not getting a good deal. Um, and 72% of editors said that their focus strategically in the next year or so is going to be subscriptions and membership, um, actually trying to own the relationships with the audiences rather than getting them through platforms like Facebook. At this point, I just want to briefly introduce an idea we use a lot at StoryThings to try and think about how the stream is changing the business models of media and culture. And we do it using a thing called the attention pattern spectrum. What's changed really fundamentally in the last 10 years is the attention patterns that audiences have have become way more complex. So in an era of the schedule, pretty much all storytelling happened in this gap between about 30 minutes and two hours. Nearly all formats for mass-produced stories lasted between 30 minutes and two hours long, whether it's a newspaper, magazine, TV show, film. If you were way over or way under that, it was kind of an art experiment. You know, Andy Warhol making 12-hour films was an art project. It wasn't really cinema. And what we've seen in the last 10 years with the rise of the stream is technologies and business models that have made it possible to create content for audiences that are lower than that 30-minute bound. Things like, you know, everything from six-second vines to, you know, kind of 15-minute video blogs and stuff like that. So there's been this huge amount of creative and technical development into what are the viable business, what are the viable products and viable business models that are going to support audience attention patterns that are between, you know, a couple of minutes long and half an hour long. But at the same time, something else has happened. We've also had this growth in content uh, experiences that last many hours. So in many ways, when people say attention patterns have got shorter in the last 10 years, that's true, but they've also got longer as well. What's happened is we've had this expansion of audience attention patterns, both up and down the scale. And for me, the next 20 years of the media industries in particular is all about understanding where on the spectrum is there a viable business model? Where on the spectrum is there an audience behavior that's going to go mainstream enough to really genuinely scale? Where on the spectrum is there a digital product that's going to support that audience behavior? And then what is the business model? Is it subscription? Is it advertising? That's going to make that economically viable. At the moment, nearly all the activity has been down here. Uh, the last 10 years has really been about trying to understand what are those behaviors, what are those digital products, and what's the monetization models. I think that actually this space over here is going to get more and more interesting in the next 10 or 20 years. And that's something that uh, we at StoryThings are focusing on, particularly around episodic content. Interval ends. Secondly, I think the prediction is that the stream will become more immersive. And this will happen in two ways. First of all, as Facebook announced at F8, they see the development of their product as taking the stream from being something that's held in our hands as a mobile phone to something that would actually be out there in real space as augmented reality or virtual reality. So imagine if the stream in 10 years' time is something that I'm seeing as I'm looking at all of you. I'm kind of seeing which of you are tweeting about this, which of you are maybe saying this is great, and which of you are saying this guy's completely nuts, I don't understand why he's here. Imagine if the stream became something that was actually visualized in everyday space. How would that affect the way that we behave as audiences? How would that affect our society and the way that we communicate and tell stories to each other? The other way that the stream is getting more immersive is it's becoming less of a product altogether. With Alexa and conversational interfaces, the stream is becoming a purely roboticized audio product. Now think about what that means for context. If one of the challenges of the stream is it's already very hard for us to read behind content in the stream and understand where it's coming from and whether it's truthful or not, 
How can we do that when it's being read to us as a result of a query by a robot voice? How do we understand uh, the context of content in the stream when it's not even physically visible? It's just an audio experience. I actually think if anybody that works in radio and audio is going to be really, really valuable in the next 10 years or so, because there are lots of ways in which you can help audiences and signpost the experience of audio, and that's going to become really important in conversational interfaces. So to close, I want us to go back to this chart. I said earlier on that this, for me, was a chart that showed how the schedule had defined not only the financial, but the cultural and social shape of the 20th century. It's an idea that lasted 100 years, from the Telefone Hamondo in the late 19th century through to the beginning of the 20th, 21st century now. I think, for the stream, we're about here. We're in the, like, the first 10, 20 years of radio, where this idea of organizing content by a schedule had just begun to emerge, but nobody had even started to think about television yet. It was just impossible to see how the schedule was going to impact culture and society and politics and a whole kind of you know, existence in the 20th century. I think we're just there right now for the stream. I think we're just 10 years into probably a, a 50, 60, 70 year development of how the stream is going to change our culture and how we tell stories. And the three questions I want you to think about for the next couple of days is, what does culture look like in the stream? How is it going to change the culture that we have as a society. Maybe the last year, this kind of really bizarre and freaky era of politics, um, in which, as Will said, we have possibly the first stream president, the first president who understands this culture of the stream almost instinctively um, because of his particular uh, psychological makeup. Um, he kind of understands it really, really, really well. And I would argue that maybe Trump is the first politician of the stream era, um, and that we need to look hard at what that means and why that might be a pointer towards the future of politics in the rest of the 21st century. What does society look like as a stream? We all know that there are huge benefits, and I am. I've been you know, saying some problems today, but I'm, I think this is an incredibly exciting time to live. There are huge opportunities for how we reshape ourselves as a society. But what does that look like? You know, we, we saw how that played out with the schedule um, in the 20th century. How is that going to play out with the stream in the 21st? And finally, for some of you, some of you are here for brands that were built in the schedule era of the 20th century that became global monopolies and behemoths and these incredible kind of cultural and business, um, uh, these, these organizations in the 20th century. Some of you are here because you might be working for brands that will be that brand for the stream. Some of you might go off and start companies that actually become the Coca-Colas of the 21st century because you're based around the culture and social impacts of the stream rather than the schedule. And that's where I'm going to leave us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.